Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. Uh, thrilled to be joined this week by George Lovatis, uh, founder and PM at Upslope Capital Management. Um, as always, none of this is investment advice. Nothing in this podcast is an invitation or solicitation to purchase or sell any security mentioned. Um, do your own due diligence. This is for entertainment purposes only. And uh, I can't stress enough that this is not investment advice. So with that out of the way, George, do you have any disclaimers we need to get a, get in front of? I, no, I've, become, I, I've become aware <laughs> of compliance as I've done this longer and longer. Yeah, no, I, th- I think you, you covered most of it. I, obviously, uh, depending on where the discussion goes, you know, uh, most likely uh, I and my clients have positions in the, you know, the stocks that we probably talk about or it should be pretty obvious, though. Yeah, and uh, and I've I've been told by other compliance departments that you shouldn't assume any gains will be or have been realized or something like that. I don't know. I, I as That's I say, right. uh, I, what started out as a fun little uh, podcast on the side has morphed into something where I've started to have to worry about communicating with uh, with compliance departments and whatnot. Uh, so I'm getting more and more cognizant of other people's needs. Yeah. Anyway, uh, how's it going? Good. Been uh, yeah. been an interesting year so far. <laughs> or it was an interesting this, 2020 also. Yeah, 2020 and 2021, the, the fun continues. <laughs> <laughs> Something that, uh, you know, I've, I've wanted to talk to you um, since I started reading your letters was probably 2019 was when huh. I stumbled upon uh, some of your first letters. And I've always um, been interested by the long, short world um, mm-hmm. but I like, I, I guess it's, it's interesting to watch you run it. It's interesting to watch your gross exposure. And I was hoping that maybe you could give people a little bit of a sense of where you came from and how you got to where you're, where you're going. And then we can kind of get into the conversation as it flows. Sure. Um, so my, my background, I, I, uh, I always tell people I, I was a pretty late bloomer to the investing world. Um, was not somebody who grew up reading Buffett letters when I was, 12 years old or anything like that. Um, you know, I was a Russian major in college, um, just wanted to do something different and interesting, and um, but knew I eventually wanted to go into to business and finance in, in some form. Um, the first half of my career, I, I sort of tag as more investment banking oriented. Um, so I started out at Citigroup right before the financial crisis doing securitization. <laughs> Uh, which was <laughs> so you found yourself in the be, middle of it. <laughs> yeah, so it was interesting to be a you know 23 year old doing that, um, and then uh, eventually you know it sort of broadened out. I, you know, I knew I knew right away I didn't want to do securitization uh, for the rest of my life, um, and eventually went back to business school uh, right you know starting in 2008, um, and I had some sense for you know I by that time I had started investing on my own, but nothing you know nothing particularly formal or or, uh, you know, sophisticated, um, but I knew I had some interest in it. Um, and it was really while I was in, in, in business school, you know, right in the middle of the financial crisis that I, I sort of fell in love with it. Um, and it was, you know, it was somewhat by accident, you know, I was managing my own money um, and just the intensity of the financial crisis and frankly, just staring at the screen all day um, kept me captivated. Um, I was always interested in, in just, you know, not just the traditional long only stuff, but, you know, learning about other tools that you could use. Um, I still remember back, actually, it was it was before I started my first job, you know, I, I had to take the Series 7. Um, and it was the first time I'd learned about options. Um, and not that I'm a, a big options guy by any means, but uh, I, I was just, you know, fascinated by the fact that you could do all these other things other than just be 100% long all the time and just kind of take what the market throws at you. Um, so, you know, during the financial crisis, I managed my own money. Um, like I said, still nothing sophisticated. I, I, you know, barely had any idea what I was doing, um, but became interested in, you know, at the time, I, I remember they had the double levered short ETF. They had all these products that you could use to protect yourself in the crisis. Um, so I was just kind of glued to my screen the whole time. Um, you know, I think probably at the detriment of, of my job search <laughs> in a way, but yeah. At the same time, you know, it was it was a tough time to be looking for, you know, for a buy side job anyways. Um, So I, you know, I I did that during business school and kind of 
decided to come out the other side uh, and, and frankly hide out in investment banking for a, a bit more. Um, I viewed investment banking as this, you know, this really broad field where you can get a bunch of technical skills, um, obviously get the work ethic um, and, you know, keep as many doors open as possible. Um, and I think if I remember correctly, I think, I think you spent some time at BMO also. Yeah, I, uh, I, I was on the credit side of the commercial bank. So technically, okay. I was actually at BMO Harris. Um, but okay. we sat, uh, we shared a floor with the investment bankers. So I got to see what that okay. life is like. Yeah, I probably walked by you at, at some point. Uh, I, I was in the New York office, but came by Chicago pretty regularly. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was up on 19 for a while. Uh, it was fun times. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Uh, I like that place. I got a lot of, lot of good people over there. Yeah, definitely. So um, what were you doing investment banking and what sectors? So I, I joined uh, and it was just, you know, I, I sort of took the opportunity as, as I found it. Um, I joined the financial institutions group. Um, oh, yeah. So general, you know, big coverage, um, sure. you know, all, all products. Um, our group was was unique. I always tell people and that, you know, people think of financials. First thing they think of is banks and insurance. And when I got there, we did neither of those things. Um, so we, our biggest focus was on, uh, they called it market structure. So brokers and exchanges. Um, and that's where I was sort of introduced to that world and kind of became fascinated by it. Um, and we did some other stuff too, like specialty finance. This makes sense. So is this kind of, uh, is this where your introduction to an idea like market access came from? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We, we, I, I, I can't say that we did a lot of business with them. I don't think, you know, market access is not a, you know, they're not deal junkies by any means. Um, but, you know, we, we pitched, you know, the CEO regularly. And, you know, so I, I sort of, um, you know, met him probably a dozen times while I was there and, and kind of became fascinated by the story. That's cool. So you were doing uh, M&A more than anything? Like, were you doing a lot of DCM? It, it was a little bit of everything. Um, yeah. You know, I think on the investment banking side, um, BMO is probably a nice way to put it as kind of an up and comer. Uh, at least, at least back then. Um, yeah. So we, you know, it, I, I've thought a lot about it. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of junior investment bankers, what they want more than anything is deal experience. Um, but BMO, it was a lot of pitching, <laughs> frankly. Yeah. Um, but in a, in a way, you know, I, I worked with some really smart people and I think, you know, being forced to be scrappy and, and you know, pitching ideas, you know, and, and instead of, you know, we didn't just show up and somebody would give us a deal. We had to show up and have, have good ideas and, they needed to be interesting and thoughtful and, um, you know, we might not get the deal anyways, but at least, you know, it, it was a, it was a great learning experience to kind of go through all that. Yeah. When I was there, um, I, I, I was fortunate to start in the, the food and consumer group. Um, okay. and, uh, you know, like what, one thing that I, I, I think BMO's got right, or at least had right when I was there is the focus on verticals. And I know fig was a vertical that they had a, pretty good toehold in so yeah on food too food was yeah food, food was probably their best best area <laughs> and for a while they had energy too but i, I don't know if that has been <laughs> exactly what they've loved so yeah. um so, okay so you come out of bmo and, and how did you sort of like figure out how you wanted to like how do you how do you get into long short management from like how does that evolution from investment occur? banking yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, under I understand how investment banking gets you connected to markets and interested, but to then sure. go to long short is kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I so after four years of banking, I I, I really still had the, the itch to kind of get back to the original plan and get back to public markets. Um, so I, I asked them to move me to research, and this will this will connect the other side of the weird sectors that I focus on, but. Um, they happened to hire a, a 30 year veteran, uh, that had been covering the packaging sector. Um, and so I, I joined his team and, you know, I wasn't, again, I wasn't looking to do packaging, but I, I wanted to do something other than fig just to branch out. Um, so I joined him and, you know, unfortunately it was, I was only on, you know, on the packaging research team for a year, uh, before I, just for personal reasons, my wife and I wanted to, you know, move out of New York. Um, so did that for a year, moved out of New York to Denver um, and kind of ripped the Band-Aid and, you know, found myself a, a buy side job at a, a startup long short fund. Um, and I can I can get into why long short more, but um, that was sort of the evolution of, you know, the literal evolution from from banking to 
you know, to the buy side. Um, you know, for me, long short, I, you know, as I mentioned before, I, I've always been enamored with the fact that you can, you don't have to just be long only. Um, part of it is that, you know, I remember during the financial crisis learning, um, you know, I was pretty young and, and maybe naive, but learning that hedge funds, you know, the, it's just a, it's a, the phrase is more about the structure than it is about the strategy. And most people assume hedge funds hedge and a lot of them don't, or, you know, they're, or they don't, you know, they're, they're really pretty close well, it's to become long more of a of payment that. mechanism than a, uh, than an actual strategy in, in many yeah. instances, right? Yeah, exactly. And so for me, I, I always, I always love the idea of, of, kind of going back to the, just the absolute classic, like long short strategy that, you know, you don't necessarily make money in all markets, but you, you're uncorrelated, you, you protect the downside in a bad market. Um, you might, you know, you're, you're probably going to underperform in up markets, but, but over the long run, you know, you still deliver an attractive return. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't exactly been the best time to be short anything. (laughs) <laughs> so, <Really? laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's wild man i mean how do you think through like what this past decade has trained people to like the takeaways that investors have right now i think is like well why would you shorter i mean <laughs> one of the questions that we got you know i i solic- solicited some questions on twitter and one of them was you know does he regret shorting mm-hmm. um you know when those are kind of the questions that are coming in uh, I guess I have two questions for you. One, how do you see the environment and what it's training investors for? And two, like, uh, I, I guess that's the best question to ask. Yeah, I, I, so maybe I'll just answer that specific question that, that came yeah. in. I mean, I, I, you know, for me, I, I, obviously everybody that has a short book wishes they, you know, converted it all to cash last March and, and, you know, we're, we're just kind of long only or long cash, but that's, you know, that, that, that's sort of easy to say in hindsight. Um, you know, for me, I, I, you know, I, I still believe that markets have, have real cycles, even though I think, you know, we've had these sort of flash bear markets over the last few years. Um, and then, you know, before that it was, you know, you have to go all the way back to the financial crisis. Um, so I, you know, I think there's still value to be had because I think, you know, long-term markets are still going to do what they're going to do. They're not, I don't think we've gotten rid of, you know, just because we haven't had an extended bear market or, or, you know, sideways period in markets for a long time, doesn't mean that we won't ever have one again. Um, so I, I don't know. If yeah. I, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I'm, I'm asking you because mm-hmm. you also run um, from what I've seen and, you know, I, I don't mean to put a specific, so I'll put a range. Sure. It seems to me that you run somewhere between 45 and 60% net long uh, on most occasions. Is that a fair thing to say or am I mistaken? Um, pr- probably towards the bottom of that range. Okay. But yeah. But yeah, I, so, I, 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 so what, a lot what, of long short guys that I see, right, are almost one thirty long, thirty short, and net a hundred right. long, right? So like on top right. of be- running long short, you're also, um, for those that don't understand, what we're saying uh, it's basically the percentage of of beta capture that you're uh, exposed to. Is that accurate, mm-hmm. right? How you would say I think, it? I think that's right. Yep. So on top of running long short, you also have a substantially reduced overall beta exposure so it's kind of you know it's an interesting time to implement your strategy and i think you've done it well from what i can see um thank you so i i'm just kind of interested to you know hear why that's where you've settled and and how you think through adding adding exposure and maybe what makes you go up higher on the on the net long or or Mm. how you think through that yeah i i so i when i think about the goals that i i'm I've sort of set out for upslope and the, the long short strategy. Um, you know, I, I want downside protection, which I think is, um, you know, you can you can marginally outperform as you know while being 100% net long on a, on the downside, but it's it's tough. I so I think you know it's it's having a, a real short book and and low net exposure is essential for that. Um, and I think you know low correlation is the other other big factor that I, that I'm trying to deliver. So I, I'm, 
you know, I want my portfolio to deliver a return that is is relatively similar similar to equities over the long run. So call it double digit percent. Um, but to me, that you know, there there are different ways you can get low correlation. I you know, obviously one is by picking, you know, unique sectors and unique stocks and and trying to do it that way. But but the other is is by also having you know a low net exposure. Um, so your portfolio does does something pretty different from the market on on most days. Um, and so for me, you know, I, I you know, I, I have I obviously I have, you know, almost all of my my money in the strategy and, and you know, the, the goal is to, like I said, just to deliver equity like returns, but without, you know, the with the downside protection and, and almost no correlation to the index. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's tough to do that without a, a real short book. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny because I, you know, I, I sort of taught myself, well, I didn't sort of, t I taught myself by reading, you know, the, the typical value investing manuals mm -hmm. and, you know, I've, I'm at the point where I, uh, I think I need to take a step back from what I'm doing, uh, to sort of reassess what I'm trying to accomplish. And, and part of why is I've been pretty dogmatic in how I think about, um, investing and like, you know, this mm -hmm. long only just prepare yourself for 50% drawdowns. Who cares? You know, go, mm -hmm. go all, not all out. I, I don't mean it in that way, shape or form, but like buy a company and who cares if it draws down the more I'm exposed to people like you, the more I'm realizing like, well, maybe that's one way of looking at the world. That's not necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, there's no Bible in investing, right? There's no like true truth. I don't right. think a lot of people get to different places uh, it, or the same place in different ways. It's all about figuring out what works for you. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it's uh, a, I, I've heard it said that long short is the new 60, 40, because it seems like, what I've seen over, you know, a couple times is when there's a sell-off now, all correlations go to one. So I don't know how much asset classes actually protect you. Right. Whereas like the short book seems to. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, I, I, I'm not a, I, I'm definitely not a fixed income pro, but you know, I think that's when I, when I sort of set out at the beginning of, of, you know, forming upslope and the strategy that, that was definitely a, you know, a part of the thought was that, in a world where, you know, if one thinks stocks are expensive and rates are really low, it's it's tough to be comfortable with the 60-40 portfolio or, you know, and, and feel like you're really going to be protected or diversified that way. How do you, so, so I guess like one of the thoughts that I have is, well, you could just carry some cash and deal with cash drag. Yep. Like when you're looking at what's gone on in the market over the past year or so, how do you protect yourself from, uh, you know, shorting these stocks that become meme <laughs> stocks and just moon, you know what I mean? Like it, it seems yeah. crazy. I, I mean, I think the biggest thing is having, you know, no, no, uh, I don't know if shame is the right word, but I, I you know, not hesitating to cover and move on even if temporarily from a stock. Um, you know, I think I've, I've sort of developed the reaction where, you know, if I see a stock like GameStop, my, my first reaction isn't to just jump in and short it. I mean, it, I might have the thought, but it's, I, I sort of know that it's not, it's You've not a great to idea. you that thought? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, cause the, the, the first thought should be like, is, is this a place where my business goes to die? And that's, those are the places where, where that happens. Um, so, you know, you might eventually decide to, to short something that's that's crazy like that, and and we're short some stuff that that is pretty crazy, but um, you know you have to do it in, in really small size, and you have to move really slowly. Um, and you know the goal isn't to to be some kind of hero. The goal is to you know is to make money on it. Um, you know I don't I don't need to prove to anybody that I'm right about GameStop or or something else. When uh, I mean, when you have to think about this, all these types of dynamics, right? When you have to think mm -hmm. about risk management on the short side, um, how how did you get comfortable? I, I guess the real question for me, if I was implementing it, is like I find the long side hard enough to do. I can't imagine uh -huh. trying to implement the short <laughs> side. You know how do you how do you yeah. um, how do you manage that in your brain? Because I think it's two very different skill sets. Yeah, I I I mean, so sizing is. You know, I, I have some pretty basic guidelines for sizing on, on both sides of the book, but but for shorts, um, you know, no short is ever more than 
five percent of the portfolio um, at, at market, uh, which which actually probably sounds really large to some people. But uh, for me, a five percent short is like American Express. You know, it, it's not. I'm not worried that American Express is going to do what GameStop does. Um, in theory, someone could buy them, but they're not going to buy them for a hundred percent premium or anything crazy like that. Um, and you know, my the the typical you know, high beta shorts that I have, you know, they are, they tend to be in the 1% range. And if they're really high beta, like some of these, you know, some of the sort of sketchy SPACs that were short, you know, they're more like 25 or 50 basis points. Um, and so that I, I've, I've learned over time and, you know, I, I sort of knew it in advance, but you have to, you have to get burned a few times, frankly, for it to really uh, be seared in your mind. But, I, you know, I've learned that sizing those kind of shorts that small, um, you need to do it not just for risk management, but also so that you're not tempted to mess with them all the time. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I was short Tesla for, you know, for too long, probably a year too plus. Long. And that that was one of my mistakes with it is that, you know, I, it wasn't a huge short, but it was it was big enough that it was such a distraction every day. Um, yeah. You know, I, I would have if I had just, you know, put it on at 50 basis points or, you know, and left it that way. You know, sure, I would have lost some money on it, but it it would not have been as much of a distraction as it was. No, that makes sense. Um, just thinking through what you just said. So when I hear you say American Express, I mean, are, are you t currently shorted or was that an example? I, I am currently shorted. Yep. OK, so so as somebody who who doesn't think through this, I, I like I don't really know why you're short. Right. But I would think, OK, big established brand reasonably mm -hmm. big market cap as you said probably can't get taken out at some massive premium exposure to travel and business spend mm -hmm. uh and sort of a like a, a setup where it could disappoint to the downside i think maybe easier than it could up surprise the upside and the skew is probably favorable to the downside is that kind of how you're thinking about it, it reminds me a sure. lot of cpg a couple years ago Generally, yeah. I, I, I mean, American Express, I have sort of a, a, a framework um, and sort of a unique, unique, you know, unique among shorts. I mean, it's very specific to American Express, but um, I have sort of a, a specific valuation framework for American Express um, where, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it. And, and I think I, I agree with everything, everything you said about the prospect of just disappointing. You know, it's, it's sort of it's been one of these reopening stocks. Yeah. Um, reopening plus, you know, plus rates. Um, but, I, you know, I, on top of that, I've got, also got this valuation framework where to me it's, it's sort of at the upper bound of valuation and it's, you know, it's the sort of played out reopening play. Um, OK, so it's it's a it, I'd say it's a I don't want you to like feel the need to talk short. too deeply about it. I'm just trying <laughs> yeah. to get in your brain a little bit about why that would be the type of company that you'd be looking for. Um, yeah. And then on the I, SPAC side, I assume mm -hmm. you're going after like some of these like really frothy type SPACs that have maybe ten dollars in trust, but they're trading at like eighteen or something like that. Or is it even more nuts than that? Uh, it's so it's it's a mix. So most most of them, you know, I'm, I'm short about ten of them. Um, I think you know two of them that are really tiny are are pre close. So they you know they they've got the trust sort of backstop. I'm sorry, just one, one of them just closed. One, one is pre-close. Um, in general, I try to not short pre-close SPACs because, you know, the, the way the event path works around closing, um, you know, historically closing meant that, that, you know, the SPAC actually fell post-close. Um, over the last year, it's been the opposite. You know, people hmm. get it. The, uh, I mean, it, it sort of sounds like a joke, but a lot of retail investors literally get excited about the ticker change. Um so that is crazy. They, they buy it up. Um, I, I think that's died down <laughs> over the last you know two months. But but there were times where you know I, I was short a SPAC, it closed, and it went up you know twenty percent the next day. You know on the day of closing, um, and there's no you know there's no rhyme or reason for it. You know normally you'd expect the opposite to happen, but but that was happening for a while. Um, so anyways, why would why would you <laughs> expect the opposite? Do you mind explaining that? I you know I I, I won't claim to be the the world's uh, foremost expert on uh, you know SPAC ARB or or you know the actual players that that buy SPAC IPOs, but I think in general um, 
you know, you have the sort of rotation from institutional, you know, SPAC IPO buyers to, you know, more retail buyers post close. Um, you know, I think some of that, my understanding is some of that occurs, you know, pre-close, but I think a, a bunch of it can happen kind of at close or, you know, shortly after. I didn't know if it was sort of the point where you go from relying on the trust value to seeing the the person that you're actually marrying and maybe the uh, <laughs> the actual it, deal becomes a little less enticing yeah. than what you thought you may own or something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, that's definitely a, a valid uh, observation. I yeah. think that's the case, too. There, it's very fascinating to, uh, I, I mean, SPACs are something that I sort of didn't know anything about, and then... Mm-hmm. I did some research on and I saw the founders economics and I was like, oh, this is all a grift. And now I've really <laughs> morphed. I mean, I do think that there's um, there's definitely a purpose for them. But uh, mm-hmm. like all good things in finance, it's probably been taken a bit too far. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Huh. That's uh, I so I, I think um, I, I guess the the overarching thought that I'm having is you know here here we're talking about SPACs and we're talking about mooning and sort of sexy stories um are you comfortable talking about WeWork at all a, a little bit yeah I, I mean it's it's uh because I, that's I, sort of the marriage <laughs> of a lot of these concepts right and yeah. I think you found yourself a little bit more um open to that idea whereas yeah. just a year ago it was kind of the laughing stock right yeah and that, I mean, that's part of the reason uh, I, I got interested in it. So, I, I mean, for for what it's worth, I mean, WeWork is, I, I, I think I mentioned in the letter, but I, I do view it as more of almost like a hedge to the, to you know, to this back short book that, that we have. Um, but I, you know, I looked at it and frankly, I hadn't considered, you know, I, I don't remember what the press report said about WeWork going public, but hadn't really considered it that much until you know, really the day that they announced they were being acquired by this SPAC. Um, and I, you know, I looked at the stock and it was trading just above 10 bucks, you know, the, the, the trust value. Um, and I thought about what WeWork represented. And, and to me, it was, it ticked a lot of the boxes, not, not necessarily on what I wanted to be long, but on what I did not want to be short. Um, so it's got this, you know, I mean, you, you can, rightfully laugh at, at, at me saying this, but, you know, the sort of open-ended growth story, you know, all, all real estate around the world, um, completely hated company, very well known to retail investors, um, you know, potentially a, a, a reopening play or, you know, quote unquote. Um, and on top of it, you had a, you know, the $10 backstop. So to me, it, it was, it's just a completely asymmetric trade where, you know, you could buy it and sure you could you could have some mark to market losses below 10 bucks but eventually you'd, you'd probably you know break even um and in the meantime you get this optionality on on the stock you know either actually performing better than people expected because expect expectations were really low um or or you know something else you know if the SPAC market as a whole takes off um so i viewed it as you know if the SPAC market continues booming it'll it'll I'll be really happy that I own it because it's protecting me against the, you know, the, the SPAC shorts that are probably not so fun. Um, and if the SPAC market collapses or, you know, or kind of continues to deteriorate, the downside is almost nothing. And, and my other SPACs, you know, the SPAC shorts will, will be in good shape. So. I like how, I like how you frame that. That makes sense to me. Uh, the other thing that's sort of interesting about WeWork is, I, I would think that actually in a weird way some of your fig experience comes into it because it is sort of a marketplace of sorts. I mean, I understand that, that that's well, easy to laugh at, right? But um <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a it's a, I I kinda get what it might become and I also understand mm-hmm. why Sam Zell has said we've seen this movie before. Like I understand both those things, right? But um yeah even I was really closed off until actually I saw your letter and I was like, oh, this, yeah. Yeah. and and also Scott Galloway had said that he was shifting and it was one of those names that like I had put into this bucket of never look at again. Yeah. And then I realized that's actually a really stupid bucket to ever even have in your mind. Right. Just <laughs> like a better bucket is probably bookmark this and come back to it. If the facts change. Yeah. Um, and it seems as though that maybe 
uh, Uber was in a somewhat similar type of mm. uh, setup at some point. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it all turns out. Yeah, I, I've I've found myself over the years, you know, re- referring to past past or current shorts, you know, talking to people, and every now and then I I inadvertently spit out, oh, I would never ever be long this stock no matter what, and um, I've I've gotten to the point where when I catch myself saying that, it's you know I I realize that I if I'm short I should probably cover at that you know right then and there, um, and you know basically it's not a thing that I should be saying. Yeah, I almost wonder if that kind of thought is a reasonably good trigger to revisit something as a long. I, I think almost certainly to cover a short, but like yep. I've noticed whenever I have like strong opinions and I haven't done the work in a while, I'm I'm almost certainly not correct. Um, yeah, you know, I I don't know. I've I've been trying to um, use the opportunity to uh, do the. I've been trying to use the opportunity of this media platform to have conversations that have pushed me in different ways. And the more Mm -hmm. conversations I've had, the more I've realized I don't know anything. And it's almost (laughs) terrifying because I had a lot more confidence before all this started uh, Uh than I do now, but you know, that's okay. That's probably a good thing. A healthy dose of reality is, uh, is probably healthy as I said. Um, do you do you mind going into uh, how Hempton has influenced you? Because I I thought that that was kind of interesting to see, and Hempton's a guy that I I've read but not nearly enough. But I he he's sharp as a whip, so I'd be curious to hear kind of what what he's meant to you yeah. as a mentor, even if you know not not like formally not or whatever. Formally, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I I mean I I so I will you know, any, any podcast he's on, I'll, I'll listen to. I always enjoy you know listening to him speak. Um, I, I can't say I've read all of his letters, but, you know, I've read a lot of the, you know, a lot and, and definitely all the recent ones. Um, I think, you know, for him, he, he's, to me, he's, he's just a very clear thinker. Um, and so you know, that that's part of the, the enjoyment that I get out of listening to him. But um, he also, you know, I, I, respect that the fact that he has a, a very real short book it, it's a completely different you know my understanding is the strategy is pretty pretty unique and pretty different um you know I, I forget how many shorts he says that he has but you know I, I think we're talking in the in the hundreds uh you know 100 or 200 um and you know has this unique approach to you know for the most part I think following kind of bad actors around the world and seeing where they land and um it's not, you know, it's not exactly, it's definitely not how, you know, how I run my short book, but I think, you know, it's opened my eyes to different ways of, of managing a short book. And I think, um, you know, in the most concrete way, I think it's influenced how I've dealt with, with SPACs. Um, mm. You know, I think I, I, at the end of last year, I was looking around at the SPAC universe for shorts and, and it was, especially as a, a one man band, it was just overwhelming the amount of potential short opportunities that seemed like there, there could be. Um, and so I, I, you know, historically, I don't, I don't take a basket approach to shorts, you know, where I, I short a bunch of them where it's, you know, it's really a, a, almost more of a macro call on the group right, rather than an individual, you know, company call. Um, but I came up with a framework for the, that SPAC basket. Um, and I think, you know, it was kind of influenced by, by sort of how my understanding of how Hempton goes, goes at a lot of his shorts. Um, so, but I, I'd say that's that's sort of the high level. Um, on the long side, I, you know, I think he, frankly, I, I haven't paid as as close attention to his long book as as you know his commentary around shorts. Um, but you know, he does seem to be invested in in relatively unique and, and interesting stuff. Um, you know, he'll have. I, I'm pretty sure he's had Google in there and at the same time as Herbalife. Um, so, to yeah. me, that's that's something that also kind of resonates with me is is just this extremely diverse, you know, kind of unusual looking long book. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, you mentioned him being a clear thinker. Uh, mm-hmm. I, something that I, uh, one of the reasons that I think I need to take a bit of a break is I, I have been on a nonstop like push and I feel uh. like uh, maybe my brain just kind of needs to rest for a little bit. I need to figure out, like what I really want and where I'm really going. 
how do you um, manage some of the stress of starting up a, a fund and also running long, short and remaining clear? Like what, what, um, <laughs> ha, you know, how do you do that? Cause that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, it, it, with, with some hindsight, it, it feels like it was kind of easy before COVID. Huh, uh, yeah. the, the last year I think was, you know, it was really stressful with, you know, managing <laughs> the strategy and, and, you know, kids at home every other day and, and, you know, trying to, you know, deal with volatile markets and, and kind of just everything that, you know, that everybody has been dealing with. Um, you know, I, I, I think before that I, I probably didn't feel the need for anything too concrete to, to manage stress other than, um, you know, playing hockey once a week and, you know, going to the gym, stuff like that. Um, you know, now I'd say, you know, when it feels like stress is getting at the sort of extreme end, um, I've, I've, uh, and it's probably, you know, every other month or so at this point, but I'll do some meditation, you know, one of the meditation apps, um, which I, I would absolutely have made fun of myself for, you know, a year or two ago, <laughs> but, you, uh, you, both. <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes, I mean, even if it's five or 10 minutes, um, it's, it's a good reset. Um, and so. That's about it, though. You know what's funny is uh, as you're talking about like a meditation app that you would have made fun of yourself for. I mean, I found myself on the Peloton app doing their meditation thing. Oh. Uh, and you know, it's uh, it's funny because the the companies that I'm open to, and I'm not long Peloton, but uh, I, when it traded down, if it had like a mid twenty billion valuation, I'd get much more intrigued. Uh. Um. And, and part of it is like I think that for a long time, I uh, I viewed the world through my own lens and thought that was reality. And mm. uh, as I've gotten a little more experience and a little older, I've realized that uh, n equals one is not exactly the truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh. And uh, you know, so like Peloton, I I actually have come to appreciate the value that the app gives. And I think a lot hmm. of people that really dismiss it are hung up on the cost of the bike and maybe not holistically looking at like what the app subscription value. Yeah. Uh, if, if you utilize it, I mean, it's pretty cheap on a per usage basis. And I know that that sounds kind of nuts and it's hard to get, you know, your head around when you look at the price of the bike, but the amount of value it adds to my life. Yeah. Even when I'm not riding the bike, I still use it. And it's like, I don't know. This this subscription, the the pull towards a subscription service is very real. Um, and yeah. COVID definitely accelerated that. I, I was not open to that kind of thought prior. Yeah, I I mean I I I kicked myself a lot. Speaking of Peloton, in it, um, I think you know leading into COVID, there was to me it was it was a classic example of just a really bad short thesis. Um, mm. You know, I I didn't I I couldn't you know I'm I'm not really a growth investor. And so it, it was, it was tough for me to get my arms around valuation and, and, you know, not being profitable and all, all that stuff. I, I'm kind of a, a simpleton on that stuff. Um, but I, I could see very clearly that the short thesis was, was bad. You know, when you see people making jokes about, okay, it's just a, it's an iPad duct tape to a bike. Um, and, you know, I, I, I sort of knew right away and then we, we got one too. And, and, you know, COVID made it clear that it, it was really not that, um, and especially having kids. I mean, I, I think it it cuts a big chunk out of your day, you know, unless you live in New York and right next to the gym. Um, being able to go into your basement or you know, the other room and work out and not have to travel um, adds a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and I think with Peloton too, the uh, the communal aspect was really allowed to thrive and forced to thrive in COVID, yeah. which is quite different. Now, I have to push back on something that you said, because you said you're not really a growth investor. And I look at market <laughs> access and I see it as a core position of yours. Yep. Hard to argue that's not a growth stock. It's it's the exception, though. <laughs> OK. All right. Yeah. That's fair. So so why I think I know uh, and the reason I think I know why it's the exception is I have a friend who uh, works in debt and he has been telling me forever to get long market access and huh. it's always got one of those, um, 
valuations on current fundamentals that I can't ever fully understand. And I have never, ever, ever been right saying no to buying it, right? I should have bought it when he said it, but he said like, look, man, this thing's going to swallow up a lot of the debt market and Mm -hmm. uh, you just kind of don't get it. And he said, you don't Uh, get it because you don't live it and that's fine. But I'm telling you as someone that lives it, that you should be long this. Um, Yeah. But I've never been able to, to buy the valuation. How, how, how did you think through it? Do you, uh, it sounds to me just from talking that like your background gave you a good sense of where they could go, but mm-hmm. how do you manage a position like that? That's, that's still kind of nascent and monitoring the, the yeah. growth prospects and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's been, it's, it's a high class problem, but it's been, been challenging over the years. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm definitely squeamish about, about valuation, you know, today and, and, from where it's been historically, I think you know when I initiated the position, uh, pretty much at the outset of this, you know when I started the strategy, um, I, I don't remember the exact number, but I want to say it was trading for maybe 30 times EBITDA, and that felt like a stretch to me. But I, you know, I, I was, I could see the runway for where they could go, um, and back then it was just so they, you know, their business is they've got a few sort of segments, but Back then, the focus was really on high-grade fixed income trading um, and where that market could grow. And eventually, it's turned into so that they've they've kind of chugged along, taking share in high-grade, and then eventually they've started you know doing really well in in high yield and then Europe and emerging markets. Um, but I you know at, at the at the very beginning, it was just kind of taking the leap that okay, this is going to be different from most of our other stocks that are you know trading for. 12 times or 15 times earnings, um, you know, it's, I don't know, it seems quaint though, looking back that at the time it was trading for, you know, 28 times EBITDA and, and today it's at 40. Um, but, you know, it, it was really just kind of a leap on, you know, I know this thing can grow. I know it's going to grow almost no matter what, what is happening in the world. Um, yeah. But it's, I mean, I've, I've, you know, it's been hard to manage the position because I, I, there have been times where valuation, um, so today the, the position is completely subscale. You know, it's less than half of a normal position. Um, and there have been other times, you know, like today where, where valuation is, is so rich that I, I just, I mean, I hate to, I'm not a hardcore never sell person, but I, I hate to sell, sell a good business just purely for valuation. Uh, you know, I think of it like shorting, you know, you, you don't you don't just short something purely on valuation. Same way you, you don't sell something purely on that. But um, I you know it, this this particular stock has tested my upper bound limit on you know sticking to something. So if if you don't sell something on valuation like purely, then what else would you be looking for to sell? I mean, are you looking for valuation combined with a sort of a variant perception on qualitative stuff? Yeah. I, I, so market access has been, you know, while, while valuation has been really hard, the fundamental picture for me has always been really easy. Um, it's just a, you know, there's a really, I, I basically look at market share. So they, for, for I guess, background, the, you know, the story is there, you know, most of the bond market today is still done over the phone kind of manually and market shares, uh, market access is share, you know, market access is all electronic and they have most of the electronic market wrapped up. Um, so all I care about and all I've you know, really cared about since the beginning has been, are they continuing to take share? Is the market continuing to convert to electronic? Um, are they still, you know, they have TradeWeb as a competitor, but they're a pretty distant competitor. Um, you know, as long as market access continues to be the dominant player in electronic trading and electronic continues to take share from voice, um, I, I just don't care about much else. Um, obviously if, you know, if margins fell off a cliff or something happened on that front, I would care, but, um, they, they haven't. I mean, I, I, I really just look at market share and, and margins and, um, as long as those things are both healthy, um, I'm, I'm happy. The crazy thing about uh, a market going from the phone to electronic is it's hard to believe that that doesn't expand the total volume traded also over time. Right. I mean, yeah. you would think that it's uh, 
not only are they taking share, but the market's expanding. And that's a, that's a powerful dynamic yeah. when you get those two things working together. Yeah. One, one, uh, one kind of funny thing that you reminded me of about market access, you know, you mentioned your friend has been telling you to buy it, that they're obviously going to, you know, keep growing and dominating. Um, I have over the years, I've actually had fixed income people tell me that, Oh, like this market's never going to go fully electronic. Like we're mm. our, our market, that that stock's expensive. Like the the, I hate the word TAM. The TAM is is limited. You know you can only have X percent of of high grade electronic because you know bonds are unique. Every bond's different. They've got all these features. Um, and you know it it. Eventually, I realized that you know it was it was people effectively talking their own book, their own career. <laughs> that like oh my my market's special. My like, job not, can't go away. <laughs> it's it's not gonna do what every major you know asset class has done forever. Um, so you know and, and you know you, you didn't know how how market access could do it and how they could continue converting. Um, but you know you could you could see that management had a good idea of you know keeping their share growing. Kind of wild that uh, there hasn't been a marriage between them and Bloomberg. That seems like one that could be made in heaven. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know Bloomberg. I mean, I don't know that uh, that even makes sense. Well, what yeah. I'm saying, but I'm just thinking of two places that fixed income, like you know, mm. is built on right, uh, or that has built their businesses around yeah. fixed income. I shouldn't say fixed anyway. Yeah. yeah, I I always assumed you know in the early days I always assumed market access would get bought by you know ICE or CME. Um, but I never happened. Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, I think some of us are hoping that SIBO gets bought now. <laughs> some of us are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how do you think through, like, the, um, the, the value add that tactical longs give you as opposed to your core positions? They, you know, it's, uh, so I think for, for core longs, you know, the goal is to just sit on them as long as, as long as I'm I'm happy with fundamentals, um, so market access is a good is a obviously a perfect example there. Um, but sometimes you know sometimes the market doesn't like the the core longs you know the high quality you know more expensive stocks, um, and so to me tactical offers an opportunity to you know to generate returns, you know, a, a little bit more actively I guess is is probably how I'd put it, um, and to get exposure to different types of market regimes. So if you know, if the market, um, you know, I don't think of core longs as necessarily growth market access aside, they're not necessarily growth stocks for me, but, um, there's a particular flavor that I, that I lean towards. Um, and my, you know, my tactical longs, I think are, I've described them as a little bit more traditional value investments. Um, and so I, you know, I, I realized that we've had a long stretch, you know, until, until pretty recently where, you know, traditional value invest investments and value stocks have underperformed. Um, and so it, it was really kind of a nod to the fact that that's not going to last forever. No, no regime is going to last forever. And I, I don't want to be wedded to just one. Um, you know, I, I still remember some of the, you know, some of the movements and I think it was early 2016. Um, when I, if I remember correctly value, you know, energy kind of cratered and then coming out of it value investments, um, flew at least for a period. Um, and so I, you know, to me, stuff like that and, and even bigger, bigger regime changes are, it's important not to just get stuck on one note the whole time. I've been, uh, I, I've been fortunate to get like an advanced copy of, uh, William Green's new book, which is a, a cool book. And it's fun uh -huh. to, to read like Templeton, um, how he danced in and out of different spots of the market and hmm. how he ran his book. Like the, I think that um, I'll just personalize it. I think I have been somewhat influenced over the past five years of watching these compounders get ever more expensive and grow into. I mean, the the fundamentals in in many of them have backed up the valuations, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <clears throat> and sometimes it's hard to remember that uh, things do ebb and flow and cycle after you know, basically my formative years as a professional have just been watching the rich get richer and some of these value mm -hmm. stocks just kind of not catch a bid. Right. Um, so it's, it's something that I'm trying to be cognizant of. And, and I like how it sounds like you've built your portfolio. It, and to me, um, 
a lot of the reason is probably because you're heavily invested in your own book, right? You want to make sure that your family is benefiting from different yep. regimes and that you're not just sitting there waiting, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I also, I, I think I mentioned it uh, a quarter or two ago, but I, you know, I think it's, for me personally, it's also the practice, you know, you, you I think you can get, if you're too focused on one type of stock or, you know, if you're too focused on growth stocks or compounders or, or you know, deep value, and that's all that you do. I think, you know, when the time comes, if there is a regime change and you can't just, you know, flick, flick the switch and, and move over to the, the new regime necessarily. Um, so to me, I think it's, even if it's, even if it's tough sledding for a while with that particular pocket of, of your lungs or, um, you know, it's, it's good practice to, to keep at it because you're, you're going to need to be good at it and you're going to need to be good at it fast when it happens. Yeah. Keeps you flexible and ready. Mm-hmm. And somewhat anti-fragile, I guess. Um, are you okay if you... We're, I'm going to do something that I want to do. I hope that you want to do it. Um, sure. I read your core investment tenants, and this is like one of my <laughs> favorite documents that I found on the internet. Um, how So tenant, uh, general and personal. First of all, I love how you laid all this out. I, I think uh, Thank this you. is like... I, I may just steal this from you if it's okay. By, by <laughs> all mean, means, please. <laughs> you put it on the internet and it's not an NFT, so I'm making it my yep. own. Oh. <laughs> um, how? So number 11 is, well, number 10 is don't do stupid shit. Uh, hmm. And then number 11 is occasionally break some of your rules. Uh, how do you uh -huh. sort of like reconcile occasionally breaking some of your rules from not doing things that is are sort of silly? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, so I think an example of, of probably that, that hopefully fits both, both things here is, is we work, right? So I, I, to me, that's, that breaks a lot of the, the rules in, uh, in that document, I'm sure. Um, but you know, I, I, to me, it's, it's pretty clear if you, you know, if you sort of lay out the, the risk reward and, and the, the downside versus upside, um, or even ignoring the upside, um, I, I'd say it goes in the category of not stupid. Um, you know, hope, hopefully I don't regret it for some unforeseen reason, but I think that's, you know, that's probably an example. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense to me. Um, one thing that you, that you had said in that document that I really like is you said some risks shouldn't have mitigants. Yeah. Uh, when I read that, I, I read that as those are the risks that you're actually getting paid for. And if you're seeing them, you probably are identifying the opportunity properly. Am I interpreting what you said in the right way? Yeah. And, and I mean, I think my part of my reason for including that is just just to force oneself to be realistic about it. Um, you know, so if you're if you're going to buy a cyclical stock like you're taking cyclical risk, that's OK. Um, I, I think I think I was sort of influenced in a way you know, I, I you know, started my career in fixed income capital markets, was in investment banking for a while. And whenever we do memos, there were always, there was always like, you know, internal memos, there was always the risk section and every risk had a mitigant that just kind of hand waved it away. Um, and to me, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at is, it, you know, that sometimes it, it's just the risk. Um, so. Yeah. And I think like with, uh, with the cyclical risk, um, maybe the mitigant doesn't have to exist in that particular investment, but within a book mm. you can be diverse. You can diversify some of that risk away, right? Uh, having yeah. an entire book you of cyclicals probably isn't the best idea unless they yeah. cycle at different times. But, um, yeah, I, I agree yeah. with that. Um, let's see, what are some of my other ones, man? I just, I thought this was such a great document. Um, the, uh, Oh, so when you said that, um, you thought that it was important to study how stocks move, you know, to mm. break it, breaking news, market moves, macro data in conjunction with a deep understanding of fundamentals. And then mm. it says that will teach you far more about investing than any book will. Um, I mean, how have, how have you learned and sort of like your framework on <laughs> when to initiate a position and why stocks move? Like what, what do you mean when you're saying that? I, I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple point, but you know, the, the classic example is a stock going down on good news, you know, or going up on bad news. Um, just, just 
really simple things like that. I think the, the, the broader point that I'm trying to make there is just that I, I really deeply believe that you're going to learn a lot more by doing than just by reading what others have done. Um, obviously, you can learn a lot from what others have done, but I think that, you know, there's nothing better than, than getting in there and doing it yourself. Um, you know, and, and I, I go back to, you know, my, my experience in the financial crisis um, where, you know, I didn't spend the time reading, you know, reading books or anything. I, I spent my time staring at the screen and seeing, you know, trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and, you know, that, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I like the idea of, um, you know, stocks going up on, on bad news and down on good news. I, I, you know, there, there's the purist in me that says like, well, who cares how the stock reacts? Right. (laughs) But then Uh there's the part of me that's, that's sort of like learned enough to know that if, if I perceive news to be good or it is objectively good, but the stock is Mm -hmm. selling off, then there's probably something there that I don't understand. Yeah. And like the market is way smarter than I used to give it credit for. Yeah. Or, 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 you know, it's, it's not necessarily that it could be, it could be that the stock is, everybody already knows that good news. Um, you know, that everybody's already longed for that, you know, for that exact piece of news that just came out and now they're, they're kind of done with the trade and they're going to move on. And, you know, it doesn't, I think it tells you a lot about positioning, which is, which is kind of an important, you know, not the biggest thing necessarily, but an important factor in, in looking at any investment. Yeah. Uh, how, I mean, as, as you're saying that I'm thinking like, you know, what I'm, it, it may just be that we're trying to, to do different things. Uh, and that's, that's mm-hmm. like a totally acceptable answer that I've, I've started to understand. But, um, you know, when you think about positioning, mm-hmm. how do you, uh, how have you prevented yourself or have you prevented yourself from sometimes like getting, too focused on the positioning versus like the, the underlying business. I mean, I know that you can't decouple the things, but one of the, Mm. one of the skills that I've come to admire a lot of you like true pros for is marrying the two concepts without Mm. sort of overcomplicating things. Uh, for me, sometimes I've, you know, again, just going back to the Buffett and Munger thing, it's been like, don't worry about the positioning, just buy good companies and let them run. Yeah. But, um, I don't, I don't know how much I believe that anymore. I mean, I, I still like fundamentally pray to that church, but I also think that's a little bit too simple. I, I mean, I, I consider it, I think a lot more for tactical, tactical longs and shorts. Um, I, I think I, I think there's room for the, you know, the leave it alone and try to forget it exists that, that, that bucket, the, I won't say never sell, but the never sell bucket. Um, but I, you know, for tactical longs, I think it's it's important. For shorts, I think it's really important. Um, you know, I mean, I I I just there are, and I've probably focused too much on this over the years. But I I, I get very uh, honed in on you know when I, when I see a stock that uh, that I I perceive as as really popular among hedge funds and and everybody's telling you the exact same thing about it. Uh, I have a really hard time being long that stock and, and resisting shorting, you know, shorting it. Um, so I just. So are you like itching to, to short cable companies right now? Because that seems like a pretty <laughs> consensus trade. No, I, I've, I've always, uh, I've, I've always stayed away from the cable companies just because yeah. I, they, I could be, my perception could be totally wrong, but I've always thought of them maybe, maybe biased by the Liberty complex but I've always thought of them as, as complicated and crowded. And those are like the two things I want to avoid at all costs. So hmm. I, mean, I don't mind some complexity, but the combination of being complicated and, and, you know, having lots of eyes on, um, just, I, I, I don't necessarily need to get involved. Yeah. I, I have, uh, I, I don't know. One of the things that I need to think about for myself is, um, like when I when I got into Charter, uh, they were going through. It, it was a billing integration issue. I mean, it was. I don't know that it's even an integration issue. They had said this is a key risk. We're moving billing systems, and then that risk sort of materialized, right? And they had some churn, and I think people got a little scared. One of the things that I have realized uh, over time is that 
I am definitely not the smartest person in that space. I am concerned mm. that uh, my sizing is too large in that space. Mm. And I like I've gotten to the point that I don't even know if I bought it for the wrong reason. I I think I mean not not that I didn't understand it, but like I don't know if mm. that billing integration issue is actually the issue that people were afraid of, or if it was the issue that I saw that I thought people were afraid of. Mm. And um, I don't know, man. It's just been it's been really interesting to be uh, in the game long enough to start to look at why why I have won when I've won, whether or not the bet size is lucky or not, and decoupling uh, skill from luck. And uh, I don't know that I've ever been less hard. confident in the markets. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard. Yeah. So you know how do you how do you uh, how do you review it? And make sure that you're sort of. Um, you know, going the right way. Um, what are some of your best practices? I, I mean, it's, I, I think just being intellectually honest is, you know, it's, and you know, there's, there's no magic formula for, for getting there, but being honest with yourself that, you know, some of these, so, some of the time, sometimes you're lucky and, or maybe, maybe a lot of the time and, um, other, other times you're not. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 you know, when I get, feel less confident in, you know, how things are going with, with this portfolio and the market. And, you know, you mentioned you've never felt, you know, less confident in, you know, in yourself and the market than today. Um, you know, I think to me, that's, that's when I start to feel that way, I, I pull back. So I, you know, I make positions smaller. Um, I, I cut stuff that's, that's kind of marginal, get rid of it entirely. You know, if I have a short that maybe I, maybe I, I still like the thesis, but it's just not that exciting. And, you know, the risk reward isn't as, as obvious, um, just get rid of it. Um, and just, you know, make, make fewer bets in general, um, fewer and smaller until, you know, until I, I, I sort of feel better. Um, but there's no, no magic formula though. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, you know, when I say that I, I don't mean to short, short sell, um, myself or whatever, but I, I yeah. just do, uh, I have a lot of respect for, for what we're up against. And I think some of, um, it's funny. A lot of people will tell retail, like, Oh, don't get, you know, you got to watch out. You're w walking into the gladiators ring. And, um, <laughs> I, I think that that's easy to sort of dismiss that advice or it was for mm -hmm. me. Um, and the more gladiators I'm meeting, the more I'm realizing like, that's actually really good advice. <laughs> um, so we'll see. I don't. I don't yeah. know. I'm. I'm glad that I started on this journey, but um, yeah. I. I definitely think I underestimated the competition. Uh, yeah. So so far, uh, I've. I've. I've been learning in a market that's been forgiving of mistakes, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, yeah. Um, I, hopefully, I, I'm not learning the wrong stuff. I, I do think there's something to be said, though, of, of, you know, not, not getting too hung up on the competition, and, you know, there there are obviously lots of you know thousands, millions of extremely sm smart people in the markets. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a firm believer in, in, you know, if, if you, if you're competent and you put your head down and, and don't get obsessed with what other people are doing, I, I think, you know, I think you can do just fine. Well, going back to the document that you have that I like that I recommend everybody pulls up, um, <laughs> you know, knowing yourself and then also realizing that there's a lot of other people playing other games. Right. I, you don't have to play the same game everybody else is playing. So that's uh, that's one of the things I tell myself. Um, I got to go to the to one of the Twitter questions. This is very important from my man, Jerry Cap. Uh, what percentage of your portfolio is exposed to cryptocurrencies, Dogecoin specifically? And uh, he, he'd like a real thought out answer on 2025 uh, estimates, please. Uh, uh, unfortunately, my, com my computer is broken, so I can't pull up the model now. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I think it rounds down to zero, though. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, I mean, dude? What do you think's going on with some of this stuff? I have no idea. I I I have at at, at times I, I've bought a very token amount of Bitcoin uh, outside of you know on my own. It has nothing to do with the strategy. Um, purely as a as sort of a sanity hedge. Um, but I, you know, I have, I have, you know, I don't know, I don't own any, any today, and have have really no long term interest in it other than as a, a speculate spectator. I kind of understand the idea of it from a, um, 
like a store of value in in the same way that I think that there's some art that has a store of value like I don't know what inherently makes a piece of art like that valuable other than people believe it's that valuable um yeah. and I I do think that's a real thing and I do think that the mathematical elegance of bitcoin provides people a uh, security um within their feeling of how many units are going to be distributed I don't mm. fully understand why Bitcoin is the store of value, um, but I don't know that it yeah. has to be the store. It's just got to be a store. Yeah. I don't even know why gold is either, to be honest. Like, everybody's like, yeah. oh, well, gold's got industrial use. Nobody that's buying gold is selling it to corporations. <laughs> like, everybody's just trying to avoid uh, inflation, right? So, but, yeah. If everyone so agrees do- on it, it's it can work for that's right for a while at least. Yeah, but I can't get any further than that, right? That it's like it's something that people have agreed to agree on. That's kind yeah. of where I'm at with it. Yeah, yeah. same here. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Uh, one more uh, for you, and then and then if you want to talk about anything else, let's do it. Otherwise, you know, I'm not trying to stretch out conversations just for the purpose of it. Uh, I've enjoyed this very much, though. Um, emerging manager, do or don't? <laughs> what do you think? I, I, I mean, I – so I, I, I sort of – laugh at the debate a little bit because I, I, so I, I did sort of a, you know, short Twitter thread on, on a little bit on the topic. Um, I think a week or two ago, I, I think a lot of people, when they say emerging manager, it means so many different, to me, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, when I first started out, you know, I started thinking about launching on my own. I, I did what everybody does and went out and got a bunch of advice from people that were, you know, on the buy side and in the industry and had a, had a lot of experience And pretty universally. The, the response was do not do it. You can never do it. Um, it only works if you start with a hundred million dollars, at least. Um, the only way you survive is if you get to hundreds of millions of dollars. And I just, I mean, I was, I was fortunate in that I'd been exposed to a bunch of emerging managers already that you know were one one person bands, um, and I I knew that there was this other model out there that you know it it's not raising hundreds of millions of dollars it's you can you know you can have a a, a one person shop and you can manage 10 20 30 50 million dollars on your own and the model works very well um, and you can focus on investing and um, you know it's a totally different game than you know, building a real, you know, large institution with a big team. Um, so I think, you know, it's n- neither path is easy. I think the, you know, the big institution is, I agree that it's, it's close to impossible. It's, it's really, really hard. Um, you know, if you're spinning out from a big fund and you're seated by, you know, by a fund or mentors, um, then, then sort of the, the bigger institutional rep kind of makes sense, but, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert on it. Um, the, you know, the one man band part though, I think is, you know, it's, it's really, really hard. Um, but I think it's, it's completely worth it for some people. I mean, for me, I, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't do anything differently and I, I wouldn't tell somebody not to do it. Um, you just have to, you know, for me, the most important thing is you need to give yourself runway. Um, so that means if, if you're not raising significant money right out the gate, you know, you keep your costs as low as possible. Um, assume you're not going to raise any real money for years. Um, and you know, that way, if you can, if you can survive the sort of wilderness years, whether it's two years or five years or, or even more than that, um, then you can focus on performance. Um, and then you can, you can eventually get somewhere with that. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's been my approach. It, it, it hasn't been an easy, you know, I started the strategy five years ago and, and officially, started underneath another fund and then um, officially launched Upslope four years ago. Um, and it's, you know, I think fundraising is, is, is I think of it like, uh, I don't know if you've ever done home renovations, but, you know. Oh, I have. I actually <laughs> sold flooring to people and I was horribly, horribly bad at it. I can't imagine somebody that had to buy the floor for me. I'm sorry, yeah. especially Bob and Judy Gold. My apologies to you. Yeah. So like I, my, I haven't done it that often, but my, my general sense is that a good rule of thumb is assume that the estimate is going to be double or, you know, twice as bad is, is kind of a good starting point. 
um, and it's going to take twice as long. And I think that's it's a similar thing to fundraising as as an emerging manager. Assume that your your worst case scenario will be even worse than that, um, you know, and it's going to take twice as long. Um, but if you know if you can survive that and you can you can establish a, a base of AUM that that stabilizes the business, um, you can focus on performance. And then you're you're like as far as I'm concerned, I'm I'm left with with the the dream job that I've always had. You know, I get to get to wake up every day and 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 focus on stocks. And um, you know, I, I'm still the business is still tiny, but it's it's at a stable point where I, I can I can focus on performance and and I don't really you know I don't really care about much else. So. That reminds me of I had a the Christmas episode that I did was my family member Jack uh, Rohrbeck and mm -hmm. the reason that I had uh, highlighted him was to me he's a story of a guy that just like always kept his nose to the grindstone and did the best that he possibly could in the situation that he had um, mm -hmm. and and when he finished that uh, he he read at the very end he read like career advice or whatever mm -hmm. and he was really upset after he wrote me an email and he was like I can't believe I forgot this he said most ideas are are pretty good ideas that you'll have but everything is going to take twice the capital and twice the time that you planned on mm -hmm. and like you got to make sure that when you're starting out uh, you understand that and mm -hmm. and I think that the you know, some of the, uh, I mean, I don't know what the emerging managers are really going through, but I have a sense. Um, and I do think that, you know, one of the, one of the things about the failure rates is it's, it becomes an entrepreneurial endeavor mm -hmm. and you're marrying investing, which is really hard and entrepreneurship, which is really hard. And those are two really hard things. And it's the, at the intersection of it. So yeah. of course the base rates are going to suck. Like they, it, yeah. it can't be an easy game. Otherwise, anyone to do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I, I i mean i think of it as you know nobody has the right has it has any kind of a right to you know going in bunch and managing a bunch of money on their own and you know doing it exactly how they want to do it if, if if that's what you want to do i mean you do have to you have to suffer for a while to to get there so yeah that's right uh, when i was starting the flooring business uh i I, I didn't even set out to start a flooring business. I just start, set it out yeah. to start a business. And for some dumbass reason, I got myself in the headspace of, well, well, I'd rather, you know, sell a big product with decent mm. amount of margin as opposed to like uh, sandwiches. And I probably uh. should have just done sandwiches, <laughs> right? Because like uh. that's a true franchise model. And what I built or what I bought was closer to, um, a branding company that required a lot of actual, um, the institutional knowledge in the product that I bought from the franchise space was hmm. lower, uh, by definition and, and by a function of what I was selling than like hmm. the knowledge I needed to have. But the reason I was trying to partner with a franchise was I needed the institutional knowledge and there was like a fundamental mismatch of mm -hmm. my idiocracy and what I perceive them to be mitigating. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know, man. I mean, it just gave me a real appreciation for how hard it is to get things off the ground. I mean, I was, there were nights yeah. that I was like sleeping at the office. Uh, I, I was often coming home, you know, at, at, I don't know, call it 11 PM to not over exaggerate anything, but you know, to get back up, to come back out to the office. And, yeah. um, it's funny because my buddy and I that started the business together, we failed horribly together. I mean, it was like just a <laughs> catastrophic, it was disgusting. I wouldn't even call it yeah. a business. Um, but now we're both doing what we want and we're both pretty successful. So I guess that, you know, if anybody is, uh, is not successful as an emerging manager and they've taken that risk, uh, what I would tell them is, uh, your life's definitely not over and your worth isn't set up by whether or not your investment firm, you know, worked right. It's, uh, yeah. I, 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 my two cents for whatever it's worth, if anybody's listening is don't sacrifice your integrity and try to do the best you can, but it's, uh, yep. entrepreneurship is a tough game, Yeah. I, but the I, rewards I, are great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, and I mean, for me, the biggest thing is just, just getting to do, you know, do the job that you want to do. And 
Um, you know, I, I've, I've sort of, I always set out at the beginning, you know, if, if it's, if it's something that I love, it's, it doesn't even feel like a job. And, and if I'm good at it, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of stick my head down and keep going and, you know, kind of work through it. And, um, if, if it turns out that I'm not good at it, then, then that's, you know, so be it. But, um, you know, it's, like I said, it's, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's completely worth the sacrifice if it's really what you want to do long-term. Yeah. Well, and something that I respect about you is you're invested alongside your partners, right? So it's, uh, or your investors, uh, however it's structured. I mean, it's, it's, um, you're doing it for you too, right? So there's, there's almost no choice once you, uh, once you (laughs) walk the Rubicon, um, where can people find you? Uh, so website is really simple, just upslopecapital.com. Um, also on Twitter, Upslope Capital. I think, I think those are the, the two main pl- lane places. That works. Do you want to cover anything else or you want to wrap it up? You're always uh, welcome to come back on. <laughs> I I'll, appreciate I'll, probably, it. I'll start up season two and you got a, an evergreen <laughs> invite. I appreciate it. No, I, I think uh, I, I'm good on my end. I, I really appreciate you having me there, Bill. All right, cool. Well, thank you, George. Ladies and gentlemen, George Lovatis and uh, Upslope Capital. All right, have a good one. Thank you.